All right, so today I'm going to review some electromagnetic wave formalism and uh, notation. And then we're going to, I'm going to show a bunch of pictures and animations of these things so you have a better sense what's going on, especially with the kind of complex complex waves, which we didn't really talk about much in, uh, in, in the ENM class and in, in other classes, you're sort of, you know, these things are thrown out uh, with, with more or less kind of formalism and visualization. So let me just review a little bit what's going on. So the, the source-free Maxwell's equations, which I'm not going to write yet again, um, they, they, have, they have solutions that are, uh, that are pretty simple. And, and the, the solutions, the, the simplest solutions that we're going to start with, and we're going to sort of branch out from there, are these monochromatic plane wave solutions. And to start analyzing that, we take our electric field, which is a real vector field, it's a real function of R and T, and we break it up into the sum of two complex fields for mathematical convenience. So this E plus of R and T and the E minus of R and T. And of course, if this field is gonna be real, these each need to be complex conjugates of each other. And so you could write this as this field plus its complex conjugate, or um, if you have a number plus its complex conjugate, that's the real part of that number squared. Uh, sorry, not, not squared, two, two, two times the real part of that number. Yeah. Your markers. Two times the real part of that number. All right, <clears throat> and um, for for plane waves, E plus of R and T. Well, this is some constant here, which is actually a. It could be a complex number. I'll, show, I'll remind you why in a second. E to the i k dot R minus omega t. Remember the plus comes with a positive spatial component and a negative time component. And the reason why this constant out here can be complex is that's how we encode the phase of this wave at the origin at t equals zero. So you know, for example, whether this is a, a sine wave or a cosine wave at t equals zero or you know, some other randomly shifted sinusoid, that's all encoded in the phase of this wave because the real part of this whole thing is, uh, I mean, well, I guess I'll call it C plus. The real part of this whole thing is uh, is the cosine of what's inside of this complex exponential. And if this number has a phase, then that that uh, that phase offset goes into calculating the real part of this cosine. All right, and and last time I went through a, a bunch of math just using the Maxwell's equations and using the fact that derivatives on this function act particularly nicely. Time derivatives just bring down a minus i omega and spatial derivatives bring down an i times the component of k. And, and from here, you get a couple of relations. One of them is that omega is c k. So this is the speed of light in, in the media. So c is the actual speed of light in vacuum, c naught, which is the normal speed of light we're used to, divided by the index of refraction. And if I were to just write the definitions of what omega and k are in terms of how they relate to frequencies of sines and cosines, well, this is two, two pi f, which is the same as two pi over the period t, that's omega, and k is, so this is c times k, which is two pi over lambda. And here, if I multiply across by lambda and by t, I get that lambda is c times the period. So this, this makes sense too here. This is meters per second. This period is in seconds. And this gives me a, a period in meters. And I would say that you know physically, it's, it makes a lot of sense to think in terms of lambdas and in terms of periods. Um, but usually, we think in terms of uh, the, the math is a lot easier if we put those things up in the numerator and think about things in terms of frequencies or spatial frequencies, 1 over lambda. 
and and then the two pies are just so we don't have to write two pi every time we use one of these complex exponentials or sines and cosines and stuff. Okay, so so Maxwell's equations give us this relation, and then Maxwell's equations also give us the relationship between the electric and the magnetic field. So so the magnitude of the electric field is just the speed of light c times the magnitude of the magnetic field, which is useful for when we calculate the intensity. And the intensity is, uh, well, let, let me just, before I introduce the intensity, the, the pointing vector is the, uh, how much power per area is being transferred. And this is a vector because it, it, the power is being transferred in some direction. If I point a laser beam toward you, the power is being transferred toward you. Um, and this is E, E cross H. Remember that the, uh, 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 yeah, let me, let me write in a second what the, the reminder of what H is. Uh, the intensity is just the time average of the magnitude, or sorry, the magnitude of the time average of this pointing vector. And using these relationships here between E and B, and D, which I didn't really use, is epsilon E, and B is mu H, and mu is pretty close to mu naught, the fundamental constant of electromagnetism. None of our materials are particularly magnetic. Epsilon is some you know, order one number times, uh, times epsilon naught uh, for, for materials like glass and water and plastic. And it's really, really close to one times epsilon naught for air, which you will measure in the, in the lab. And taking all these definitions and plugging through and, and doing the time average, averaging over one period of the cosine, gives us a simple expression for this intensity in terms of just the magnitude of this, uh, of this component here. So this, this is just two over uh, this eta here times the magnitude of E plus squared. Uh, and and for for a plane wave, the magnitude of e plus is just this this prefactor squared. And um, let's let's think about units for a second. The the units on electric field are volts volts per meter, and you can remember that because dv is the integral of e e dot dl. So if this is in volts. We're going from some location A to some location B. If this is in volts, then E has to be in volts per meter. So that you do this integral and you get volts. So, so this thing squared is volts squared per, per meter squared. So volts squared per area squared. But we want an intensity, which is watts per meter squared. And remember from electronics or circuits, V, if v equals IR and the power is I times V, I can solve for solve for i and plug that in, I get power is v squared over r. So if I have something in volts per meter squared and I want something in watts per meter squared, I would need something in, in units of ohms. And so this eta here has, has some units of ohms. And let me just, eta, where did that come from? Well, that came from all the Maxwell's equations. And so eta itself, uh, it, it just must have to do with uh, epsilons and, and mu's. And the actual eta itself is one over the index of refraction times this eta naught in vacuum, where eta naught in vacuum is the square root of, is it epsilon naught or mu? No, it's mu naught, mu naught over epsilon naught. And if we were to calculate this, this ends up being around 377 ohms. All right. so. That's, that's kind of the extent of my review. The, the, and the reason why I did all this is because let me, let me just say a couple of things. From here on out, we will completely ignore the magnetic field. So uh, even, even when we get to lasers and interactions with atoms, except for maybe some little problem that you might do in Jedi quantum, all of the important stuff that's going on has to do with the electric field. And the magnetic field is just coming along for the ride. 
the magnetic field of the of the propagating electromagnetic wave. So whenever whenever you have uh, you know, if you have an electromagnetic wave, and let me let me I'll I'll draw it briefly, and then I'll show you the picture. This is your your axis. If the wave is going in this direction, in the k direction, and there's some electric field direction and some magnetic field direction that's kind of poking perpendicular to these, and if the electric field is is waving like this up and down, and the magnetic field is going to be waving in and out of the page. So in or out, in, out, in. And so all we need to do is specify the electric field and Maxwell's equations tell us that the, the magnetic field is perpendicular and we can get the magnitude of the magnetic field just by uh, dividing by C if we know the magnitude of the electric field. And once we have that, we can get the pointing vector and the intensity and all we ever need to keep track of is the electric field. And in fact, we'll go one step further in almost all of our optics, which is we, we don't even worry about the magnitude of the electric field itself. Unless you're doing radio stuff or you know, radio astronomy, which, which we might touch on a little bit, there you actually have an antenna and you actually attach a, a voltmeter to it, essentially, you know, an amplifier, and then you measure the volts on the antenna. There you will actually measure the electric field. But in all real optics experiments, you can't measure the electric field itself. You just measure the intensity. You measure the power. And uh, in some, maybe in the in the next video or in two videos, we'll uh, I'll show you some detectors that measure power. They're just little photodiodes that are calibrated to to properly measure total power. Um, you're not even usually measuring intensity. You're just measuring the total amount of power that gets into your detector. And you can measure intensity by changing the the area that you allow into your detector. So typically we're measuring intensity. And let me give you some, some typical numbers. So uh, sunlight, sunlight is about one kilowatt per square meter. So that's, you know, straight with the sun straight, straight up above uh, minimal effect of the atmosphere. Uh, if you, you're getting about one kilowatt per square meter. That sort of sets the, the maximum amount of power you can get from solar panels in the, in the middle of the day. And a laser pointer, a laser pointer, that's, that's about one milliwatt. If I, if I shine my laser pointer at a power meter, it, it reads roughly about a milliwatt, maybe two or three, depending on the laser pointer. And, and it's about a uh, one millimeter squared in area. And if you, if you calculate the power, you know, watts per, per area, it works out to be about the same intensity as the sun. And this, this, this makes sense. If you, if you go outside on a super bright day and you shine a laser pointer on the sidewalk, it's, you, can, you can make it out over the, the sun, but it's not you know, blindingly bright and it's not completely lost. Uh, in a dark room, it looks pretty bright, but so would letting in a little bit of sunlight. So, you know, one, one milliwatt is a typical power for, for a beam. Um, and uh, at, that those intensities are sort of pretty typical. And let me take it one step further. We will almost never use a properly calibrated power meter for our measurements. All, all of our photo detectors, and you can think of cameras or photodiodes, that you used in electronics lab or photodiodes that, that we use for uh, uh, for a lot of the optics experiments we'll do, they're, they're not absolutely calibrated to actual watts. They just, they're attached to some amplifier and you just set the gain of the amplifier however you want. And once, once you fix the, the gain of the amplifier, the signal that you get out is proportional to the power that's coming in. But that constant of proportionality depends on the amplifier and depends on uh, the, you know, how much light is getting through and how, how good the coatings are. We almost never measure absolute power. And so what we'll do is we'll, almost all of our measurements are gonna be relative measurements. So you can think of your camera. You know, when you get an image, you, it's not calibrated to some 
watts per pixel. It's just some, some number. And you can tell, OK, this pixel was twice as bright as that pixel. But you're never really worrying about absolute power. And uh, same thing with our photodiodes. We'll do a lot of relative measurements. We change something, and we see by what fraction this changes. And so what that means is that almost all of these prefactors, like this 377 ohms, uh, that we're not really going to worry too much about that. The actual prefactor in front of our electromagnetic waves often will leave it arbitrary, and we'll end up just taking ratios of powers at the end. And so I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures of various real and complex waves in, in different situations. And almost all the time, I'm just going to set this coefficient to be 1, something convenient. And we'll just look, look at where there is more or less power or where the electric field is more or less. It's, they're all relative measurements. And, and in optics, a, a big part of the art is making these relative measurements, because making absolute measurements is, is always hard in physics, but it's, it's usually not, not what we care about. We care about the shapes of things and the relative, uh, relative intensities of this versus that. So with, with that said, let me share two different things. One is uh, just uh, slides from Physics 51, I think. I'm just going to show you two pictures so that everyone is sure to have the same, same things in their heads. So, so this is a better version of this picture I drew of the electric and magnetic field pointing perpendicular to the direction of propagation, which is to the right here or in the x direction here. Um, for whatever reason, in electromagnetism, we, we often had the waves propagate in the x direction. But in, in optics, they always propagate in the z direction, uh, just because typically in, in physics, if one direction is singled out, we make it the z direction, just because that's how cylindrical coordinates work. OK, so we have electromagnetic waves with an electric field and a magnetic field perpendicular to it and of the you know, proportional amplitude coming along for the ride. And we draw pictures of plane waves like this. But really, I, I think, unless you really thought about it, this is kind of misleading. This is as if there's a single line along which there's a wave. Really, what, what's going on is if it's a plane wave, the plane wave itself does not depend on, in this case, y and z. The, the spatial dependence of the plane wave is all in this direction, is all in the x direction. And so it's not that there is a line along which these waves are waving. It's that every line in the x direction has the same, same waves. So really, this is a much better picture up here. There are just planes of up-pointing electric field followed by down, followed by nothing, followed by down-pointing electric field, followed by nothing, followed by up-pointing. And that whole, these whole sheets of uh, vector fields are coming at, at somebody standing here. And it's, it's hard to draw these things. And it's hard to draw the, these and the magnetic fields at the same time, these whole you know, space-filling plane, uh, pl stacked planes of uh, fields. So normally we just draw this one this one line and we just draw the electric field along this one line. Uh, but you know, keep in mind this is really what's going on. If you're standing here looking at it, there are whole sheets of up and down fields hitting you. All right, let me stop this share. And let me go on to show you a bunch of stuff in, in Python where uh, where I will visualize various fields. Uh, and and from I'd say from this point on. Until we talk about the polarization of the waves, where we actually care about the direction that the electric field is pointing. And again, if, uh, I'll say this when we get to polarization. But the, the, when we say the polarization of this wave is vertical, we mean the electric field is vertical. The magnetic field, again, just sort of comes along for the ride. Uh, until we get to polarization, we're really just going to be worried about intensity. We're just going to be worried about the amplitudes of these vectors and where they go and and when we add them together, what happens? So um, until we start talking about the polarization of waves, imagine that everything is polarized in the same direction. Everything is vertically polarized. And so we don't even have to worry about the fact that it's a vector, because we're going to add, add things, and they're all polarized in the same direction. All right, uh, let me stop this, and let me share, share the uh, Python. 
Uh, let me make it a better ratio here. This one, yeah. Okay, so everything that I'm gonna show you, I will, I will upload to Sakai. Okay, so you can see you can see Jupiter, right? Okay, so uh, and if you ask me questions and ask me to tweak tweak various things here, we, we can. I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of go through a bunch of these simulations. And I'm gonna end end the class a little bit early. I, so let me load load the notebook. Uh, let me load all all the stuff that along with that. Um, here's some stuff to make animations, which if you started the homework, maybe you played a little bit with that, just importing some animation stuff. And let me just show you a real plane wave. So this is not a complex plane wave, a real plane wave propagating in a certain direction. And what is happening? Error. Uh oh. Uh, uh, I see what I did. I was messing with this. Okay, hold on. Let me try that. Okay, there we go. Okay, so, so this is a snapshot at t equals zero of a plane wave looking, um, which is gonna propagate in this direction. So here I'm just having it propagate uh, a little bit in in y and a little bit more in x and not at all in z, and uh, this is just a cosine that that will move in this direction. And let me show an animation of this. So so this is the same plane wave that's moving along in this direction. And here, when I'm showing these real waves, you have to remember that. The, the actual cosine goes positive and negative. So the whites are peaks of the wave, the blacks are troughs of the wave, and this sort of neutral gray color, that's zero, zero electric field. So when, when the wave is pointing in this direction, uh, it, the wave fronts are always perpendicular to this k vector and it's moving in this direction. And let me show you exactly what I plotted. Uh, yes, what I'm plotting each time is this. So cosine of, kx times x plus ky times y minus omega t. And the animation is going through different t's. And I have the animation go through uh, a, full, a full cycle. And then it starts over again. All right, so, so this, is, this is just a real plane wave where you have to worry about both positive and negative. Let me, let me close these to not build up a whole bunch of figures. Um, okay, now what I'm gonna do is and this is really not part of your homework, but the, there's a function here that will turn complex numbers into magnitudes and phases. And I'm just gonna define this function and show you what it does. So here I'm just gonna plot Z, the complex number Z, which is X plus I Y. And to make, make a complex number in Python, you multiply by one J. That's to make, it, to make an imaginary number. So X plus is X plus I Y. Uh, with with that colorized function, so this is this is just showing you uh, a complex number in the complex plane. So so if the complex number has zero magnitude, you get a black black color, and as the magnitude gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the lightness gets brighter and brighter and brighter. And so if the magnitude is one, which is this circle here, then you have some nice rich colors. And the color depends on the phase of the complex number. So this is a, because I'm just plotting X plus I, Y, this is the, a real, real axis and this is the imaginary axis. So positive real numbers will be some shade of red that gets lighter and lighter and lighter. Negative numbers will be some shade of this cyan, which gets lighter and lighter and lighter. Pure, pure positive imaginary numbers will be this sort of greenish yellow. Pure negative imaginary numbers will be this sort of purple. But the color will will tell me the phase, and the magnitude will be given by the lightness. And uh, it's a pretty common technique for plotting complex functions because what's nice about this rainbow coloring is that it's it's cyclical, just the way your color perception works as as red transitions to 
orange, yellow, green, cyan, blue, purple, back to red. Uh, but you get this nice uh, meeting at, at two pi transitioning back to zero. So let me just show you some waves using this color coloring. So let me, oh, uh, uh, here's sort of a side note. The, the lightness, you know, how, how black versus white it is, um, it's, it's not really a linear mapping. There's some, when, when the magnitude is one, the lightness is gonna be halfway. As the magnitude of the complex number goes to zero, the lightness goes down to zero. And as the magnitude of the complex number goes higher and higher and higher, it's gonna asymptote out to one. So there's a whole bunch of different functions you can choose that have this property where they start out at zero, but they only asymptote out to one. Uh, one of them is this arctangent function, but there are some others with various parameters here. So that's, that's just a, uh, a technique for plotting these complex numbers. Let me actually show you here, this is not super relevant for optics, but maybe in quantum mechanics, if you have a little Gaussian uh, wave packet, it's, its magnitude you can see is, is a Gaussian symmetric centered around zero and its phase is slowly changing in some particular direction. And so uh, there's these rainbow stripes that, that go off in, in this direction. All right, uh, so let me show you some, some actual, this is just kind of to emphasize that the, as the magnitude falls away from the center of the Gaussian, it gets blacker and blacker and blacker. And, uh, and here the magnitude's about one. So you get these vivid colors, they're not washed out yet. So let me show you some, some plane waves So this is an animation of a plane wave. This is just e to the i kx minus omega t. So these are the, the kind of things that we were dealing with when I talk about the e plus wave. So I've chosen the same k vector for, for units of k in the x direction and two units of k in the y direction. And uh, the animation uh, looks very much like the 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 real wave, it, there's still wave fronts that are going perpendicular to this arrow, but the magnitude everywhere here is, is just one. So the, the magnitude of e to the i k, k dot r minus omega t, the magnitude of that is always one. And the thing that's moving, the thing that's waving is the phase. I'm gonna stop that and go back up. It's different from, from before where we had our, our, uh, our real plane wave where the actual amplitude changed. So, you, so I think that one of the hardest things that, that people get confused by is the, the magnitude of this real plane wave changes, right? It's a cosine. It, 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 the, the magnitude of the cosine is, is one and then it's zero and then it's minus one. The magnitude of the complex wave is always the same. And uh, that is useful for, for working out the power. So, so now let's, let's talk about um, uh, let's talk about interference. Uh, actually, let me see what this was. Oh, here I'm just changing, here's an animation where I'm changing the K vectors. So as I'm changing the K vectors, I'm not erasing the old ones, but as I'm changing the K vectors, you can see that the, the wave fronts change with it. I'm not, I'm not animating in time. I'm just animating t equals zero snapshots for different k vectors. And here I'm going to add two real waves together. So there's a cosine that's going in the direction of this red arrow and a cosine that's going in the direction of the green arrow. And if I add them up, their sum looks like this weird pattern always moving here. And I'll, I'll show you exactly what, what's happening. The thing I'm animating is this, cosine of uh, k, k1 x component times x, k, k1 y component times y minus omega t. So uh, half of that cosine plus half of this cosine. And let me zero out one of the cosines. So let me zero out this cosine. So zero times that cosine. So now I'm just getting the, the cosine that's that's going in the red direction. If 
I zero out the other cosine, zero times, I just get the cosine that's going in the green direction. And if I keep them both and add them together, I get this interference pattern. Now, let me distinguish between the amplitude here, which, so say these waves hit a screen and the screen is, is along this wall. If I, if these were radio waves and I had an antenna that could actually measure voltage as a function of time, this, an antenna right here would always measure zero volts. There's always destructive interference at this, at this point, right? It's always this sort of neutral mid-level gray color. Whereas if I put my antenna right here, the antenna would measure negative volts, positive volts, negative volts, positive volts. So, so the amplitude is changing. And if I were to measure the intensity, remember the intensity is the time averaged amp, uh, amplitude squared. So there would be high intensity here and it wouldn't be changing. There would be no, uh, no change in intensity over time because the intensity is already a time average. High intensity here, zero intensity here, high intensity here, zero intensity here, high intensity here, zero intensity here. So I get a nice uh, interference pattern. Let me stop that. So this is all just taking two cosines and adding them together. So this is the regular real waves interfering together. Um, let me show you a complex version of that. So here's, here my animation is e to the e to the i, remember this 1j is, is Python's way of writing the square root of minus one. So e to the i k1 dot r minus omega t plus e to the i k2 dot r. So x component and y component minus omega t. So uh, when I add those together, well, let me show you what these look like individually. So let me zero out this one. So, so the one of these waves is just going along this arrow. Its magnitude is always one everywhere. Let me zero out the other one. You can imagine what that looks like. Oops, it, its wave is always going along this gray arrow. And let me let me keep them both, so I won't zero out either of them. Now, when I take the sum of those. As, as complex numbers, uh, I get this picture here. So again, I get wave fronts that are approaching the screen. And here it's a little bit easier to see because the, let me stop sharing for a second. Because the intensity is just the magnitude of this complex number squared, all I need to do is look at the magnitude of those plots. And that, that becomes the intensity. And the magnitude of those plots is easier to see in the complex representation. All right, here, here there are these stripes that are black with zero magnitude. And here there's the maximum magnitude where the colors are most vivid, and then zero magnitude and maximum magnitude. And so uh, if you have a a detector anywhere, it will just measure the magnitude of these waves as the intensity. And because the detector averages, it it's not like a voltmeter or an antenna. It's not going to see a, a time dependence. It's just going to see the intensity. So let me, uh, yeah, let me just show you that. So let me stop that. Uh, here, I'm just going to plot I'm going to make another plot where I'm just taking the, the absolute value of, of this picture. I'm just going to show you the absolute value of this picture. And it, it just looks like this, right? There's zeros here, maximum zero here, maximum here. So, so as you move this screen and all you're capturing is intensity, you're just capturing a photograph or capturing it with a photodiode. Um, you, you just see this wavy pattern of maximum intensity zero, maximum intensity zero, maximum intensity zero. And, uh, and the intensity itself has no, 
no time dependence. It doesn't change in time. Uh, okay, so let me let me pause there and and take questions about that because I, I think that uh, translating in your head between these real waves, you know, here's here's a real a real a single real wave that that has peaks and troughs, peaks and troughs, or the interference between two real waves, which looks like this. where some places on the screen are getting high, low, high, low, high, low. Some places on the screen are just getting zero, which is this uniform gray here. Um, translating in your head between this picture of actual cosines traveling and this picture of sum of complex numbers and then asking about what their magnitude and phase are um, is kind of a I don't know, the most important skill for understanding how to translate the math of, of this way of doing optics with, with these complex waves into actual measurements where you're measuring intensities. And we've sort of predetermined that the math tells you that the intensity is just the magnitude of this complex number. And there is no time dependence to intensity. Even though these these waves are coming at you at the speed of light, it's the phases that are coming at you at the speed of light. The the magnitudes here are are not changing at all. The magnitudes are just fixed. As uh, uh oh, they're just fixed as that. All right. So let me let me see if anyone has any questions, and then I'll sort of hint at what we're going to do next time. In fact, let me put a color bar here. So here, here this is this is intensity. Maybe uh, intensity magnitude only. All right. So here, zero zero intensity really is black, and maximum intensity is white as opposed to the real wave where zero intensity would correspond to the sort of gray, not positive, not negative, right? Zero here for the wave is, is this gray color, not positive and not negative. And if I were to plot the, the magnitude of this, it would just be all, all gray. There would be, this would be a totally uninteresting plot to plot the intensity of a plane wave going in some direction. Uh, if I put a screen out here, it it would just be, you know, lit up constantly at some some particular intensity. Uh, okay, I haven't heard any questions, so let me hint at a preview for for where we're going next time. Uh, next time we're going to talk about waves that are not just plane waves or sums of plane waves. We're going to talk about uh, beams with different profiles rather than this infinite plane profile. We're going to talk about more realistic beams, like laser beams, especially. And, and laser beams have a Gaussian cross section. And let me plot, let me plot that here. So here's an example of a Gaussian beam. So if at, this is a two-dimensional slice. And you can imagine this whole slice being rotated uh, in and out of the plane. And this is a, a frame of a beam, say, inside of a laser cavity, but even, even a beam that's leaving a laser cavity. The, and it's, it's in this complex uh, magnitude and phase kind of plot. So, uh, so the, the wavelengths have to do with the distance between these stripes. And this beam is traveling, say traveling to the right. Um, and the uh, if I took a cross section anywhere, not just at the center, if I took a cross section anywhere, 
uh, the intensity would have a Gaussian, Gaussian profile. And what we'll learn is that there's a link between the size of this beam in the center and how, how far it needs to spread out. So I think, yeah, here's a whole sequence of animations. Very narrow beams have to spread out a lot. And as you make the beam wider and wider and wider, it can not spread out as much. So what actually leaves the laser is more like the beam at the end. How can I stop this? Cannot. And let me do the one with the little slider here. Yes, yes, yes. Computing. Everything's a little bit slower when I'm sharing the screen over Zoom. OK. All right, so, so an actual laser beam looks more like this, right? It's pretty uniform. But what we'll learn is that even a laser beam leaving, leaving a laser has to spread out a little bit. You can never have a perfectly collimated beam that just goes on and on and on forever. And the less you want it to spread out, the fatter it has to be leaving the laser. And the, the smaller you make the beam at any point, the more it will have to spread out. The angle that it spreads out gets bigger and bigger. And if you focus a beam down to a really tiny spot, then it has to spread out quite, quite a lot. And that, that will be a result of just solving Maxwell's equations with, uh, with these nice Gaussian profiles. Uh, and and we'll, we'll start that work next time. All right, so um, I'll, uh, I'll take questions for a few seconds as I'm erasing the board. But this should be kind of the end of the plane wave interference stuff. You should be able to do everything in the homework and all the plots that you make should, should be sensible. Uh, I don't ask you to plot any of this complex stuff. I, I, might, I might next time. I, I'll just ask you to plot the real, real stuff. Um, when it's collimated like this, where you have like a really big, like wide beam, if we mm -hmm. like zoomed out and we're looking over much longer distances, would it be spreading out similarly? Yes, yes. We'll, we'll okay. learn that there's a relationship between the angle of spread and the size of the beam. And roughly, let me, let me stop sharing here for a second. The, the angle that it spreads out has to do with um, it's sort of lambda over the diameter of the beam. And maybe there's some order one factor here in radians. But th this ratio of the diameter of the beam to the wavelength of light determines the, the angle that it spreads out. So say if you have a, um, a laser beam that's, uh, say it's five, 500 nanometers of, and the, the diameter is one millimeter, that this is like a typical laser pointer laser, it's still gonna spread out, but the, the angle in radians is gonna be pretty small. All right, uh, I've got to I've got to get going a, a few minutes early, but uh, I am happy taking questions for a few seconds as I erase the board. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Prof. Colicchio. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.